and welcome to Are You Without Sleep, a podcast where I carry around a little human and try to make a fall asleep by talking about boring subjects like the cloud. For today, we'll take a high-level subject to talk about AWS organizations, and if there's still time afterwards, we'll go and do a little bit about AWS SSL or AWS Single Sign-On. The first organizations. So, when you get started with AWS, in your case, probably by stealing that spread of card, you start with a single account, which is great. And you play around with it, you spin up a couple of things, you see what you can do. But if you're going to end up using it for any bigger workloads, anything more productionized, it's such a bad word, but something that you can share with different people. And especially where you want to have a clear separation between your development and playground environments and those where you run your production workloads. Once you have that, you need a way to connect all of these together. So within AWS, the tool to do that is AWS Organizations. I'm guessing you can understand what that's all about. It is a way to organize the structure of your different accounts. In fact, it takes a lot of cues from organizational structures in companies. So when you create an organization, you do so from what from that point on will be the root account. Now, quick tip here. If you had this playground account where you did a lot of stuff, don't use that one to make your root account. Just create a completely new account and start your organization from there. Because one of the best practices for an organization is that you don't use the root account for anything other than the organizational structure and a bunch of services that AWS doesn't allow you to run from anywhere else, despite what they say that you shouldn't run anything from that account. Now, once you've created the organization in your Google account, you can then add accounts to it. There's two ways to do so. Obviously, you can create completely new accounts. You can do this from within the organizational pillar of the console, and it's all easy. The other way is to add existing accounts to it. Again, this is a pretty straightforward process, and all you really end up having to do is send an invite, have that invite accepted, and then a part of the organization. Uh, within the organization, but then you can organize your accounts. And it may not come as a big surprise, you can group accounts in organizational units. Yes, exactly like a company. So some basic options here, you can have a production or you a non-production or you, and you put their respective accounts under there. There are many blog posts, but the right way is to organize your accounts, which accounts you should have, and quite frankly, I'm not going to go into those right now, because a lot of it depends on your use case, what you use it for and what you need. But why should you use an organization even when you don't have a lot of accounts yet? Well, there's a bunch of good reasons for this. First one is that it's the preferred way these days to do consolidated billing. What is consolidated billing? That is simply that you can set up your one account and everything you spend in all the other accounts will show up on that one single bill. And when you go into the account, you can still see the costs per account, per region, per server, any way you want them. But you only get the one invoice and that is very convenient. It also works when you have AWS credits in the days when there were a lot of in-person events, you often get a chance to get credits. But even now, for example, after the event, if you'd gone there, probably got a invite for a survey, and if you fill that in, you get a $100 credit. These credits apply, you apply them to your master account, billing account, and they will count for all your accounts. Well, I did not mean to make that sound so silly. Anyway, that's one good reason. It makes your billing a lot easier, and if you're in a company, that means you're finance department is probably a bit happier because they don't have to deal with potentially dozens of separate bills. But there are other very good reasons. There are a whole bunch of services that allow you to do things with other accounts in your organization. Good examples of that are Stack sets, which is a way to deploy CloudFormation templates from a single place across multiple accounts and regions, which works really well with organizations. You can set it up so that a new account gets added and basically runs your stack sets to that account and you don't have to think about getting some base learning in place, which is great. Another useful one is RAM, the Resource Access Manager. This allows you to 
share certain resources with other accounts in your organization. This can be many accounts, I mean, many things. Well, not that many, to be honest, but it includes things like VPC and subnet, where you can share those across different accounts. It sounds a lot more complicated than it possibly is, and I'm not going to go into how that works right now. But aside from that, a lot of the advantages are also around the security suites. So when you look at a bunch of um, security-based services like GuardDuty, or security hub is all based around the idea that you can use them within an organization and you consolidate information into a single account from all over your organization, which is really great. The last part of the organizations that is really worth a mention is SCPs or service control policies. What these allow you to do is at the highest possible level, define some things that can't be done. So one purpose that I have used it for in the past is to limit deployments or to limit anything from running in only certain regions. Say Australia based, due to regulations, you may only want to have services run in Australia. You can do that with service control policies. You can basically deny anybody from spinning anything up in a different region. You have to be careful with that though, because there are some global services, IAM, Route 53, and a whole bunch of others, and you don't want to accidentally shut those up. So you'll have to include some exceptions. I'll include a link to an example of this in the show notes. <coughs> it looks like somebody is not quite asleep yet. So we'll move on from organizations, which have now given high level overview to SSO or single sign-on. So SSO is also a service that is dependent and additive to organizations, which I mean you can only run it from an organization and it needs to run from the organization of boot account, as it's one of those services that unfortunately goes against against AWS's own best practices. I'm sure that one day that will get fixed and we can run it from a dedicated security account. In the meantime, what SSL allows you to do is manage users from a single place. So for example, if you would need access to any accounts or even other services that are hooked up, we can create a user for you in SSL and then you log in through the SSL portal and you will see the different accounts, the accounts that you have access to with the roles that you have access. It's quite nice. Obviously, AWS is not not the only service that does things like that. If you've spent any time in the business world, you're likely to have run into similar solutions. It doesn't even have to be business world because it's the same idea in a way as things like sign in with Facebook, sign in with Google, sign in with App. It allows you to use a single password to access multiple things. Of course, the main feature here is access to AWS accounts. And you can actually integrate it with other user backends. So while there is possibility to manage the users directly in SSO, this is very limited and it's all console based and the console isn't very good. And there's many things I like about the service, but the interface, especially the admin interface, is pretty is not very good. That again will probably improve over time. But you hook it up to possibly an existing thing that you already use. Say you use AD for your user management or you use something like Okta or Ping. <coughs> And then you can use that to log in to AWS SSO. By the way, it's a free service, just like organizations. There's no overhead for using any of that. So when you look at it, you can have permission sets, which is what they are called, mapped to groups or users. And then when the user logs in, they can see, for example, I've got a developer role for the non-product app. That's great. Then they can click or they can go to the role and they will either log in through the console or get access keys, temporary access keys because these are in roles, not users. If you use the CLI version 2, you can also set that up to easily get renewing tokens. And uh, at a higher level is what AWS SSO is. So, kind of organizations, which we use to organize our accounts, and SSO, which we can use to organize our users. I think you're asleep now, so I'm going to put you in bed again, and thank you all for listening. <laughs>